Now, for the past, you know, we have been reading the John's Gospel. And if you remember last week, what did we talk about? We talked about the witness of John the Baptist and how everybody came and asked John the Baptist, are you Christ? He said, no, I am not. Are you Elijah? Then why are you baptizing with water? Or why are you bringing in baptism of repentance? And John says, what does he say? He says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. I am actually a forerunner of Christ. And I am, and the main purpose of John is to identify the Messiah. John is very clear. He does not take the glory, though a lot of people come to John and they get baptized. They are repenting. And repentance of through water baptism. But John says, and this is what uh, he says, that there is going to be somebody who is going to come. I am only going to baptize you with water of repentance, but he is going to baptize you in the spirit. Now let's see the next instance of what John the Baptist has to say. Now the next day, John saw Jesus coming. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold. What does it say? When we want to show something very precious, what will you say? We say, Behold. Look at this. Such a great thing. And he says, The Lamb of God. One thing I would very quickly mention before I forget is it says Lamb of God, not Lamb of Man. This is a provision made by God. Now when we think about Lamb, is there something that reminds you, Joshua John? The Lamb in the Old Testament. What is a Lamb? Do you remember anything about the Lamb? The Lamb has to be guarded because it's really used to like lion, I think. Okay. We also have to sacrifice the lamb. You have to sacrifice the lamb. When was the lamb sacrificed? Um, to save the sin of the other people. Okay. Something wrong. Okay. That's when. What about you, Jesho? Do you remember anything about the lamb? Okay. No. That's fine. If you, if you go back to Old Testament, let's open the Bible in the Old Testament. We can see that, as John said, yes, there were animal sacrifices. The first instance of the lamb we can see in what? Way back in Genesis. And it goes beyond. See, we have to also realize, remember, is that you know God over the period of time is slowly revealing Christ. And the first time when he talks about Jesus, he's talking to Eve, Adam and Eve, when they sinned. And he says, he says to Eve that there is going to be a seed. If you look at Genesis 3.15, it says, there is going to be a seed which will crush the serpent's head. Okay? 15 says, and I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And the next instance, if you see, is in uh, chapter 20, in verse 21 itself, where the animal is killed. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. This is, tunics of skin is nothing but, it is an animal skin that has been given to them. Okay? But, the, the, but even if you go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, we can look at Cain and Abel. Do you remember the story of Cain and Abel? If you don't, let's read this very quickly. And if you remember, and so Genesis chapter 4, verse 2. Abel now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of, to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn and of their fat. Now, if you if you look at this, this is nothing but sheep that he brought, and a young sheep is known as a lamb. Okay, so this is where the first instant 
very clearly it is given that Cain, that Abel provides a sacrifice. Now, I am sure a lot when you were small in the Sunday school, they used to tell us, you know, Cain did not bring good vegetables. He brought rotten vegetables. But Abel brought very good sheep. But that is not the case. Nowhere in the Bible it mentions that. But you have to remember that if you want to worship God, you have to worship him according to the way he reveals himself or he tells about it. You cannot worship God the way you want to worship. And this kind of thing we can keep on seeing all across, even in the Old Testament times. Now, when the law of Moses was given, there were two people, uh, especially in Leviticus, we can see that, that they were the sons of Aaron. And Leviticus 10, chapter 10, and we'll just look at 1 and 3, just to see that the sons of Aaron, immediately after they've been made priest, what they did, then Nabat and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Our God is a very holy God. And if you want to worship him, you know, he's so holy that we as human beings do not understand. We think that our God is like us. It doesn't matter whatever we give. Okay? But God is very particular. And even in this case, if you look at Cain, an Abel story, you know, if you look at verse 6, it says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? God questions Cain. Because God is saying, you knew that I will only accept a animal that has to be sacrificed. And why are you angry and why has your countenance failed? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, do well, sin lies at the door. The reason why you did not bring an animal sacrifice, though knowing it, is because sin is there in your heart. Because you felt that I can that he can worship the way he wants to go. Now, this is not very clearly mentioned in the Bible that God asked Cain and Abel, but you know the picture is very clear. When God wanted to clothe Adam and Eve, he kills an animal. So there is looking for an animal sacrifice. And even as we go across. Where is another instance that we can think of, of a lamb? Any idea, Yeshua John? And, and like uh, when God is talking about Revelation, he said the lamb will lay the lion. No, we're just going slowly from the Old Testament. We'll get to the New Testament. Okay, the next one that we can see is in Genesis chapter 22. This is a story about Abraham and Isaac. Do you remember? Genesis chapter 22. Let's open that. This is also one of the greatest. This is actually, uh, if you have to see this, the, uh, when, when John was referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God, this is actually what it was, it was talking about. And, and, this, and, and it's the same thing that is going to be done by Jesus. Genesis chapter 22 onwards, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, if, if, you, if you look be, uh, uh, like uh, previously, Abraham was... Uh, God had given promise to Abraham. Abraham did not have a child. And finally, after 100 years, he finally got a child. And God says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God gave him the promise of a child. This child was a child of grace. All the strength of Abraham was lost. There is no other way that this child could be done. But Abraham is told to sacrifice his son. And Abraham says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering. Six words. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood are there, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Even at that time, it was quite clear that even before Moses gave the laws, that you had to bring a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay? And Abraham said, It was, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now, if you look at this very clearly, this is a picture, a lot of people say, is a picture between God the Father and God the Son. <laughs> Just as Abraham here represents God the Father, and Isaac represents God the, God the Son. And he is going to sacrifice his son. If you remember, we read in John chapter 1, he gave his only begotten son. And Abraham's only son is willing to sacrifice it. Okay? And it says, wood was given to him. He, Isaac carried that wood on his back. What is that wood represents? The cross. And what about the fire? The fire represents the wrath of God that he had to bring upon for the sins of all his people. Okay? And if we go ahead, then we see that just when Abraham is about to kill, the angel of the Lord comes, and from verse 11 onwards, let me read this. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket of its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. See, again, if you look at it, just when Abraham is about to kill, what does God do? He provides a ram. A ram is not nothing but a sheep, a male sheep. Okay? So, though it is written as ram, it is a sheep. The sheep was given to him just as Abraham said, he will provide. And God says that this is the place, this is the mountain where God will provide. The Lord will provide. In other words, it is also called as Jehovah Jireh. Okay? Jehovah Jireh. Now, it's very important to understand what did God provide to Abraham? Did God provide to Abraham all the wealth of the world? You know, Abraham was a very wealthy person. Did God provide him the only son, the only inherited son that he did not have? Is that the reason why he named him Jehovah Jireh? No. He called him Jehovah Jireh because God provided a sacrifice unto himself. God needs a sacrifice for our sins. And he's such a great God that he is a God who is going to provide for that. Now, when I was an Armenian, 
I used to go to an Armenian church. You know what they used to say? We used to sing this very, very famous song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. My God will provide all my needs. And what happened was people used to change the meaning of what Jehovah Jireh is. To say, no, it is providing for your needs. And a lot of uh, faith healers and a lot of people who talk about prosperity gospel, they'll use this song. They'll see, just sing this song, God will provide for your blessings, money, health, wealth. But this is not what it means. And it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And if you remember, Christ provided that sacrifice. And that is the reason why John says, it is Behold, the Lamb of God, not of man. You did not bring a sacrifice unto God, but God provided a sacrifice for himself. We are not worthy to bring a Lamb worthy of sacrifice. And this is very clearly shown even during the Moses time. Now the next instance where the Lamb is talked about is the... Any idea? In Exodus, it's the Passover lamb. Now God has, uh, if you look at Exodus chapter 12, please open Exodus 12, Exodus 12. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, uh, God has uh, already you know, cursed the Egypt with nine plagues. And in the 10th plague, you know, what does God say is that let me read that verse for you. Exodus 12, verse 13 onwards. This is the 10th plague. And it says, uh, or it's 12th, or it was one onwards. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. Okay. And then, and take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's needs, you shall make your count for the lamb. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. For four days the sheep has to be kept aside to see that there is no blemish that will grow even after taking the lamb. Okay, and then it says uh, to then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at the twilight and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door post on the lintel of the house where they eat and they should eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boil at all with water, but roasted in fire. You shall let none of it remain until the morning, and what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hat. So shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. And I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood and I will pass over you. The blood shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a foretelling of what is going to happen. The blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ. Those who believe on him are the people who hold on to the lamb's blood. And when the, when he will look at the blood, he will pass over. I was asking who can be righteous? Nobody is righteous, but Christ is righteous. But God requires that every person should be righteous. And God is saying, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Judgment will not come upon people, those who 
hold on to Christ. Now we can keep on talking about even uh, uh, it is very clear that God requires a sacrifice. God okay. requires a sacrifice to atone for our sins. And that is the reason why he says we should not boil the meat but roast the meat. Let's see why. Now when God is giving the Leviticus uh, you know the all the laws of sacrifice. This is what he is doing. You look at Leviticus chapter 1 and says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When one of you bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd and of the flock. If this offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without a blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. And it shall be accepted on his behalf to make an atonement for him. That's why a hand has to be placed okay, on the burnt offering. And just look very quickly look. Uh, Leviticus, even as we are there, chapter 17 and verse 11, 17 level. This is very important for us to understand. I know that whenever you are small, we all talked about that, yes, Jesus died for us. But where does it all come from? How Christ is fulfilling every demand of the law from the Old Testament. 17 11. This is very important. It's, it is talking about how you should not eat the blood. I'll, and 11th verse, 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and have given it upon you the order to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Okay. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, no, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Why? Because it says, the life of a flesh is in the blood. Okay? And that is why the blood had to be poured out to make an atonement of our souls. It's a reminder. And, and if, if we keep on talking the same Lamb of God, we can see in Isaiah 53, 7. And this is what Probably people think that John the Baptist was referring to Isaiah 53 7. It's a very famous passage. It is, it is talking about the Messiah, the suffering servant of the Messiah. Isaiah 53 7. Very quickly read it. These are words which are very precious. And it should always, whenever we think of a lamb, we should always think about it. Isaiah 57. He was oppressed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he not, opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before it shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus Christ came as a lamb. He came as a lamb. A provision made by God the Father, not by man. Why? Because man is so sinful. If you could look at all the Old Testament, what does it say? Man did not listen to God and it became so worst that the last chapter of Malachi, if you look at the last chapter of Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1, it says, you have robbed me. You have robbed me. How have you robbed me? Seven, it says, oh, you have despised me. Six, uh, six words. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Seventh verse, you offer defiled food on my altar. But in what way have we defiled you? By saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible. 
and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice is it not evil and when you offer the lame and sick is it not evil offer it then to your governor would he be pleased with you would he accept you favorably is the lord of host man is simple he can never provide to god the the proper sacrifice that can be accepted and that is the reason why somebody has said that what god requires god provides god requires a sacrifice and god provided it in jesus christ a lamb behold the lamb of god he says who takes away the sin of the world let's pause for a moment here it says who takes away the sin we have seen all across what what the purpose of the lamb was to make an atonement but what is john the baptist saying who takes away the sin of the world what can we think about it now when we were when i was attending an armenian church people would say oh the world jesus died for everybody is it true did jesus died for everybody oh jesus died for everybody but there is a comma but either there is a comma there is a full stop there is a comma but he cannot help you he went to the cross he died he did not know whom he died for he made a provision for salvation and people just like us reading malachi people are saying they are bringing an offense to the sacrifice of christ they are saying this sacrifice is not perfect so what should you do oh he requires your help to save you god provided the perfect sacrifice but he requires your support to save you so then what exactly is john's gospel talking about when he's talking of the world now we when we are come to the reform period we realize it is god god did not die for everybody rather he died for his elect in fact every person that he died for was in the mind of christ when he was dying when christ was on the cross of calvary he says it is finished he does not say i have done my part no and 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 he did not say that you know i have done my part it's up to you now whether you want to accept me or not and that is the reason why a lot of wrong you know messages about christ are being preached oh can you please accept jesus if you only accept him he is a sovereign god he is lord you don't accept him he accepts you he did not, you you don't you don't have to make him the lord of your life he is the lord and he has said my son i have died for you and this and this world when when we look at this world this word called as world what apostle john is not talking about each and every individual he is talking about the inclusivity now you have to remember that jesus has come only to the nation of israel only the nation of israel had the law the messiah had to come only through the nation of israel that was what was prophesied like they said that the messiah would be the son of david but what apostle john and also john the baptist was referring when he's talking about the world is it is inclusive of everybody this gospel is now going to go for every tribe and nation every tribe and nation it is not only limited and that is the reason why we when john keeps on using the world word world is not talking for each and every person because god is not a is, is not a is not an unrighteous god that he first once he takes the payment an atonement of everybody's sins then he'll once again ask the same thing 
and if you believe that god died for everybody the lord they are also called as universalist universalist are those people who believe that christ died for everybody and the, the they do not believe the concept of hell at all they think there is no hell because god died for everybody so after some time god will uh, you know hell is a very temporary place everybody will go to heaven that is not true if you remember last week we looked at it that when he baptizes you he will baptize you with spirit and with fire fire is for those wicked people god does not have any pleasure in the wicked and it, and it is there and this is and the same ideology you can see in uh, revelation actually revelation chapter 5 this uh, if you look at revelation 5 revelation 5 and here also if you could see we could see the imagery of the lamb of god who is opening the scroll and it says that revelation having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent out in all the earth then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand and of him who sat on the throne now when he had taken the scroll the four living creatures the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp a golden bowl full of incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scrolls and to open its seals for you were slain you have redeemed us to god by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our god and we shall reign on earth remember 10th verse out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation these are the people who died died for not for the whole world this is what john is referring to when he's saying the world people without distinction every person every tribe every nation every tongue and what he has made them he has made us kings and priests unto god you are a king god has made you the king and the priest christ was a perfect king prophet and priest and now he has made us kings and priests to rule on this world on this earth what do you mean by ruling not that you will have physical rule but that you might reign through the word of god okay so this is what the word is talking about so let us not confuse when people say oh world means oh everybody that you know he has died no it is only for the elect and we will see the same thing more further on when we look at john 3:16 here also it says for god so loved the world that okay. he gave his only begotten son and once we go to that verse we'll talk more about it but this is the idea behind the world and if you remember where if you go to chapter 1 in the verses beyond he was not uh, eight on was he was not the light but was sent to bear the witness of that light that was a true light which gives light to every man coming into the world he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him he came to his own his own did not receive him but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become the children of god to those who believe in his name all the children of god are the world and how are they made who are born how are they born 
not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. These are the elect of God. And we have to be very, very clear. Because a lot of people confuse when they look at this. Let's go ahead. And even as we look at this perfect lamb provided by God for his elect as a sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice without blemish. It says, and John the Baptist says, This is of whom I said, After me comes a man preferred before me. I did not know him, but he should be revealed to Israel. This is the work of John the Baptist that he should reveal the Messiah to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. John's gospel, uh, John's the John the Baptist gospel, uh, the good news was to show who the Messiah was. And John says further on that I saw the spirit. Of course, John's gospel does not talk about it, but if you look very, very clearly, it, it is... Uh, properly explained in Luke. Luke. Let's look at Luke chapter 3. This whole instance of the doubt coming from Christ or Jesus. Luke chapter 3. And we'll look at that instance. Verse 21. 3.21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in the bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which says, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. It's very important in a lot of this, this whole picture that has been said. You can see the Trinity in action. You can see the voice of God the Father saying to Jesus, He is my Son. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming in a bodily form like a dove and descending upon Him. So we can see that Jesus being the Messiah is not only being witnessed by John the Baptist, but also by the Spirit of God and also by the Father. And what does he what is he saying? You are my beloved son. I am well pleased in you. God is not pleased with us. God is not going to be pleased with our sacrifices. He is only pleased by the sacrifices of Christ. And that is the reason why the gospel is to understand the person of Christ and the work of Christ. I'll never take away the glory of Christ saying I did this, I did that. A lot of people will say, oh, they'll come and say, they'll think that, you know, there is something else that we need to do apart from believing on this Lamb of God who died for us. And a lot of people will give, you know, a lot of uh, have a lot of emotional testimonies. God spoke to me. He told me to do this. He told me to do that. No. You cannot please God by your works. Only God is pleased by the work of Christ. And his work will he look at. His blood only will he look at. He will not look at how beautiful your house is. No, he will look at the blood and pass over it. This is the blood that I'm going to pass over. And even as John says, even he does not know. 33 verse, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize did not say to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remain, remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. See, John's Ministry was very famous ministry. I think we have seen previously also as well. There were a lot of people that even after Christ came and he died, there are some, some, some disciples of John the Baptist. Everybody were there. And there was a huge party too. And you can see even the Pharisees came. 
they were questioning who are you who is this person why is he drawing so many people to him and john clearly identifies this is behold the lamb of god behold the lamb of god even the next day it says john stood with two of his disciples and looking at jesus as he walked he said behold the lamb of god john is crying out this is the messiah this is the lamb of god and as you could they could see that there were a lot of pharisees as well what happened then why did not the pharisees believe in the testimony of john the baptist it was very plain very clear see the gospel is very it's very simple we don't have to make it very complicated what is missing and we have seen this before and uh, when we looked upon it and peter actually and if you look at if you look go, even as i read further you can see there were two other people disciples who followed jesus there were two disciples of john the baptist who listened to john and they followed jesus and this is where the first disciples of christ are come we we'll look more about it but but if you look at it why were the pharisees a lot of people were there only few why this is what uh, uh, peter talks about and first peter if you look at the uh, peter chapter 1 oh, sorry first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 and it gives us a difference what differentiated the the disciples of jesus christ with the other people and to whom the word was told that this is the messiah that did not agree i will chapter 2 verses 4 1 peter 2 verses 4 onwards coming to him as a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by god and precious you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house a, ho a holy priesthood do offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ therefore it is also contained in the scriptures behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame now this chief cornerstone is the elect is jesus christ and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame therefore to you who believe he is precious but to those who are disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense they stumble being deceived disobedient to the world to which they were they also were appointed they were ordained for this disobedience so did jesus die for all the whole world no people who rejected this stone and if you look at chapter it says lo uh, behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone for those who are the elect it is precious for those who believe in him it's precious but for those who reject it it's a rock of offense it's a stumbling block and that is the reason why if you look at the world behold the lamb of god there are people here who are not happy with the lamb of god they think the lamb of god is not sufficient they think we need to do something more bring something more to the table grace is not sufficient and they keep on adding more works oh you believe in jesus so what you should live a righteous life you should go and do 
attend the church regularly, pray, you know, great commission, go and preach. But this Lamb of God was sacrificed for you so that you might know him, that you might grow in the knowledge of God. And who can see this Lamb of God? Not everyone can see. While the Pharisees, we can look at Pharisees and say, say you know, they are Pharisees, I am not a Pharisee. And we can laugh at them, but we all are Pharisees. We all are recovering sinners. <laughs> Why? not believe on this lamp of God was because they were they didn't need a lamp you know when they were thinking of the Messiah they were thinking of what they are thinking that he will be somebody like David king somebody who will kill and who will remove them from the oppression of the Rome they were looking for a prophet like Moses just like how Moses delivered them from the land of Egypt, that cry, Messiah will come now and he will try to deliver them. They had the wrong idea of God. But what about the disciples of John? You know, these Jesus' disciples were who were they? Where they learned people? No, they were fishermen. Fishermen. And fishermen were uneducated. They did not know the scriptures. They did not have time to read the scriptures, meditate upon the scriptures. But yet God had mercy. And if, if you look at uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter, I think 11, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 onwards, 11 to 25 onwards. And Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except, except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Lord wills to reveal him. And he says, come to me all you labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And this is what the true uh, disciples of Christ were. They were heavy laden with sin, with guilt. The Pharisees did not want somebody to die for the sins because they were righteous in their own sight. But not the but not the fishermen. And that is why Jesus says, I do not come for the save the righteous, but for the sinners. Today, even as we look and behold this Lamb of God, let us be reminded of one thing. Has God shown you the need that someone should atone for your sin? Or are you too or are you too self-righteous to say, I don't need atonement. I need a Jehovah Jireh who provides for my needs, for my jobs, for my toys, for money, for life. Has God given us? Let us look at and ask God because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he said, blessed are you if you hunger and you thirst. May God give you this hunger and thirst even as we participate in the Lord's table. Let's pray quickly.